<laughs> I had a question for yeah. you to start about, specifically about your accent. Before you read the piece, mm. and I'd read it in print, I was wondering if you were going to do everything in the accent mm -hmm. or just his dialogue. Right. And it's this odd, is there a name for the Michigan, Texas, Michigas, no, Michigas I mean, accent? There's, there's not, but it's just called fake, you know. It's fake, yeah. right. So, when I was reading it, when I read the story when it was published uh, low these many months ago, uh, and imagining how you would read it, his speech is affected. Now, when you read it, his narration and his thought, I assume, also are, are affected. Did you think about, do you, in your mind, do you think this makes him more or less affected, or was it just an opportunity to get into the groove of the voice? Um, well, let me just tell you how, the, how it came to me in the, in the writing. I first was writing a story about essentially the same subject and ha had, had a plot um, in mind and uh, had a draft of it, a couple of drafts of it. And then at one point, I thought, what if he's, what if he's Texan? What if I write it in a Tex Texas drawl? Um, and so I started to do that, and then I began to feel a little bit um, just funny about doing that. You know, it seemed, it seemed wrong. And, and then I thought, no, he's not, he's not Texan. He's actually from Michigan, and he's faking it. Um, the way that when George Bush left Yale and he went down to Texas <laughs> and put on, you know, that kind of, right. that kind of phenomenon. Um, and it, it's, it's, it clicked in my mind. I mean, this guy has got so many problems and is, is um, a stranger to himself in so many ways that the, the fact that he had a, a false voice, that the narration was, was not true, seemed to make sense for me. So I didn't, that's not really answering your question, but that, that's how I came to do it. Now, when I, when I read it, um, of course, when you write a story, you never think, I'm going to have to say this out loud. Right. And then you do have to. Um, and I, I realized I, ha I couldn't just read it in a normal, a normal voice. I mean, you feel, hopefully, the Texan drawl when you're reading it. But if I read it in my normal voice, it would just sound very strange. And then there's, there's the problem with the different characters. I'm now thinking I should have had you answer that question in the accent. Am I turning it? Sometimes I do just, it gets a, a little, little infectious. A little tiny bit. I think when you said <laughs> George Bush went, left Yale and went down to Texas, yeah. you leapt into it a little right, bit. Right, right. The, so, but that does answer the question in a way, because the question was, when you composed it, did you think all along the way that there's an element of fakery and, and yeah. pretense in his, in his identity as well as in what he's saying to other people, as he's presenting to us? I was also happy that you started, because it's the beginning, with stomach turning smells here at the, at the dinner. I, I enjoyed that. People I don't know were, if anyone... People were finished eating. Did anyone this. actually vomit at all? No. Damn. Um, so, this is a standalone story, right? It, it never will... It has not and will not be part of anything larger, as far as you know? No, no, it will not be. When you start, do you always... Or at what point do you know... It's enough was, right of that. Sometimes know. do stories grow? Are they roots and shoots that you think... Like, are there novels that you thought, oh, this will just be a story, and then it gets into you and it blows up to 350 pages? Um, it, it can happen easily that you, that you write a short story that then becomes a novel. I have a trouble keeping things short enough and keeping to one idea. So when I have an idea, I usually get two or three different ideas, and suddenly I'm dealing with a larger, a larger thing. So it's often, often the case. The only thing that happened in terms of this was that um, after it came out in The New Yorker, my, the agent who deals with film called me up and she said, you know, this would be great with Matthew McConaughey in it. And, and she wanted to make a movie of it. And the idea of him... That's good. That, that That's I, not short-term reactive <laughs> at all you in, know, in the, year, in the month of that. his greatest fame. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but he would be good. Mm. I imagine he would be good. Yeah. I'll look forward to that. Got to fatten him up, though. He's getting too skinny. He can, gain, he can lose weight. He can gain weight. It's yeah. the same. It's the same thing. It's... Uh, it's also the first story I can remember, and maybe there are more, first story I know of where Words with Friends was a, a character. And, and I wanted to ask if that's, I know you've talked a little bit about in other interviews playing it, but I wanted to extend that question a little bit and say, as a writer, what does it do or not do for you? Is it just what Scrabble used to do for us, or, or is there some new dimension to it where uh, it's actually a, an assistant or an mm -hmm. obstruction? It is actually... Um, my main occupation. 
And, <laughs> You've switched over, so words with friends yeah. and then writer you know on the you side. Know, I over. actually played Deborah Treisman at the. At, at the words New York. with friends. Yeah, and During I can always. The the no, she's always. See, I play all day long. It doesn't matter to me, right? But she has a job at the right, New Yorker, right. so she she does it. Like I can see always on the subway to work and on the subway leaving. Or like, you can like spot when she's playing. You can tell a lot about your opponent and what they're, you know, what kind of, how desultory their life is by, by playing them when the words come in. You know, my, I'm, I'm awake at 2.30 giving, giving a new word, and they know things are bad. They know, right? Like, there's something wrong with Jeff because exactly. he responded at 3.15. But we om th because this is an excerpt, the story is actually a little bit longer. Um, and we, we, cut, we cut out the words with friends um, to be in The New Yorker, but I really need, wanted it to be in there. And I got it back in. Um, oh, in, you fought in it back in. I, I, yeah, we got it back in. But it, for me, what was it, what's? I'm now answering the question. What's different um, about it for me than, than Scrabble is the way it connects you to someone far away. And we didn't get to the end of the story, but he's a, right. you know he's a, a not estranged from his daughter. Well, slightly estranged, but he's um, out of contact with her. The only contact he has is through this this device. And at the end of the story, there's this description about the noise. Um, it makes, or the, the wonderful tinkling music that happens when the other person plays a word and the, and the letters magically appear. And that's really connected to his feeling about, about his daughter. So it, it was, um, it, it's, that, it's that strange thing that I think we're all dealing with now is this palpable sensation of being with people who are, are not present that, that we get through all of our devices. Well, the, and, and elsewhere in the story, there is a lot about not only that feeling, which has existed as long as there have been people, but the way that feeling is amplified or mediated now by technology. There's a lot of technology and, and law, in this case, the, the restraining order. Also, there's at least a couple three-letter, there's the TRO, the restraining order, and then the PBRs at the VFW, which I think are a terrible words with friends, hand. If you put all those letters in a hand, I don't know what you could do. Probably no. nothing, right? No, yeah. You haven't tried to play that with Deborah, have you? They won't let you do those things. <laughs> you they can't load up. A f I'm going to invent an app to let you schedule your moves different times of the day so people think you're living a healthier life. That's a very good idea. Like you play at 3 a.m. and then it Such shows up idea. at like lunchtime. And yeah. then they think, oh, he's just taking a constitutional. Right. He's taking that 10-minute break between <laughs> the 18 hours <laughs> right daily at the desk. He That's must be at the gym because <laughs> it's just a weird period. That's it's a good a app. What are you going to call that app? Uh... I don't know, someone, yeah, it'll someone, be crowdsourced. Yeah. I'm going to crowdsource <laughs> okay, the name. Good. So, all right, so you have Charlie D, and yeah. beating a dog generally is not a laugh line. But I noticed that when you read that moment, people laughed, mm -hmm. because I think out of discomfort or shock mm -hmm. when, that, when that happens. And it's not a brutal, I, let's not overstate it, it's not a brutal beating, but he does strike a dog. And I wondered at that moment, you, you, and you say right after that, there's a great moment where you ask if Damien knew he was evil and Omen, or Omen 2, I would assume if he didn't know at Omen, he would have known probably by Omen 2. <laughs> but, I, but I wondered about... Uh, Damon never seemed that sharp to me, really. Right, he might not have seen the film. Yeah, We, we right. don't know, the documentary. But the, uh, so, so that question is all over this, this story, uh, self-knowledge and various kinds of self-knowledge. And I wondered with that move, when you give a monstrous behavior, even if it's a sort of petty monstrous behavior to a protagonist, you're risking people leaving him as, you know, the thing they always tell us when we're, I don't know, 16 and trapped in a writing class. You, there has to be something for the audience to hang on to, right. the readers. That's a risk. I mean, there, there are people, I assume, who would leave him in some essential way at that moment. What was your feeling about letting him put his hands on a pet? Well, the, the, the way this story, I hope, works or should work is that it, it, it seems at first like a very broad comedy that becomes... Um, much more serious as the, as, the, as the story goes on. And I think what might keep a reader interested in Charlie is that he seems quite sincere in trying to figure himself out and to leave um, you know, much of the errors of his past away and actually to connect with his wife and is unable to, to do so. But he really is sincere in, at, at some level about, about the marriage counseling. It's treated in a comic fashion, but you know, he, he mentions beating the dog because he feels terrible about it. Mm -hmm. So I think um, that's, that's the way in. I think we all do have those, those moments in our lives where we've done something that maybe we've hidden from everyone, moments of perhaps violence or, or mendacity, um, and they shock us, and yet they've happened. And what are you, what are you to do with, with them? So this, this guy is finally, fairly late in life, confronting that, um, and, and that is, Hopefully, the, the, the way that he's, he, he doesn't become entirely repellent 
as well as that he's, you know, rather funny, hopefully. And, and I think, and, and we won't give away the story, and if people haven't read it, they can go read it in the New Yorker, on the New Yorker, dot com website, but that even when what you read so far, the idea of this sort of synthetic hick taking counseling very seriously is, is there. And I, I think, as you say, that's an interesting move because it does come off a of satire as you, when he's first going in and he makes the joke about seeing your neighbor coming out. But pretty quickly, it's evident that this is something he's committed to, if, if not the marriage in all ways, at least the counseling to try to figure it out. And so were you as disappointed as I was to find out that he wasn't the real Charlie Daniels? <laughs> no, I was, I was, I was you happy. You knew? I knew that. <laughs> I did not know. <laughs> so one of the things in reading other interviews with you over the years that I really like is that you are, I want to I start a kind of lightning round. You, you, some authors have a problem talking about books in general. They want to always kind of make it about their own book or, or their own theories. And one of the things I really like about interviews with Jeff is that you, you seem, and maybe this is a misread, but you seem to like talking about just the world of books that we are cut loose in, and actually having opinions, which is also fairly rare. A lot of times there's a lot of hedging. People say, oh, the book was, there were things about it that I liked and things that I didn't, which is now a phrase you can't say because I've pre-mocked it. So I wanted to ask if you'll consent to a reading, a reading in general lightning round until we're out of time. I, I think that, that question was structured so that I would be so honest and, and offend so many of my friends that I don't think I can... Oh, they might not be contemporary authors. They might. They well, may be as dead actually, as the dead tweeters. I, um, you can start it, but I don't know if I'll end very oh, yeah, we well with the lightning round. And we can bail out of the lightning round. I actually That's didn't know happens. there were any other books. Yeah, this is news to me. <laughs> but please. When you go into bookstores, do you think the rest are like just props? Well, being, being an, you know, a writer... Can, his, his ruins bookstores for you. Oh, yeah, really that's does. totally true, by the way. Because I, there was no place oh. when I was a young, aspiring writer that I liked to be more than, than a bookstore. Have you written about that? Because um, I, I think that But now a lot. you go in and you're like, where's my book? You know? Right. It's shelved weird, or they turn it. Or like, they don't, yeah, it's underneath the. Or they have copy, more copies of an old one than the yeah. new one, and you think, is that because the people read yeah, them? Exactly. Or just because they stopped caring? Right. It's terrible. It's, it's not, like, you know, you got, yeah, so it's. It's like a dead person going to a cemetery. It's terrible. It's, so, okay, so the lightning yeah. round, which you okay. can bail out of at any point. All right. What was the first book that made you feel you wanted to do this writing thing? Oh, that's, that's easy. I've talked about that a lot, but it was the Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man I read in high school and took it very, very literally. Um, you know, he gives up the priesthood to, to assume the mantle of art, and that sounded really great to me <laughs> in Gross Point, Michigan in 1976. Um, and I thought, I will be a writer. I would love to be a writer. Um, Stephen Dedalus is the name of that character. That's kind of a weird Greek name. He's all, Stephen Dedalus could appear at the Onassis Foundation for a talk. And maybe well And I then. thought, maybe I'm like this guy. You know, so, so I decided I wanted to be a writer very early because of that. And then I got to college and read Ulysses. And I see that Stephen Dedalus has no money. He's living in the Martello Tower with this guy, Buck Mulligan. Things are not really looking very good for him. But it was too late for me. I'd already, I would already made my... Choice. But in fairness, he's now immortal. Stephen Dedalus. Yeah. yeah. Not well, Joyce, but I know. Dedalus. Yeah, well, it worked yeah. out okay for him. So how about your least favorite consensus masterpiece? Is, oh. is there one that you depart from consensus uh, on? The first one that comes to mind is The, the Magic Mountain, which I've tried to read a number of times. And um, always stop in, in the three-page description of the pencil shavings that he saves from the boy that he's kind of in love with. Less mountain, more magic is really what... But people do love it. So the thing is, I never want to say a, a book like that is, is, is not good because so many people get a lot from it, but it just it didn't work for me. So right, I, for you, the personal you. Yeah. How about a book that... Is there a book that you read young and then upon returning to it felt like you gravely misunderstood it when you returned? You either had a different reading or switched your appraisal of it entirely. Hmm. You can say pass at any point. That's what well, happens. That's an interesting one, but you know, the books that you, I guess you remember rereading are the ones that you benefit from rereading and they, they seem even better and, and you, you understand exactly how they're composed and structured and you know, the, I can just think of, I can think of a lot of books like that. Um, so none of them have turned on me. Um, Nor you I probably, them. if reading a, a book the second time, wasn't responding to it, I might, I might not even keep reading it. But if I go through the whole time, usually it's a rich experience. How about, in the Magic Mountain, you can't use that again, but a, <laughs> a classic that you've 
never read and either know or fear, fear that you will never read? Um, that I never will read. Yeah, either for temperament or because, I don't know, it could be for an idiosyncratic weird reason or because you don't own it and are too lazy to There's go get so it. There's so many books like that. There's a lot. I but mean, is there one that you think you're, you're somehow cut off from and will never get to? Well, one I would like to read that I've only read about 10 pages of is J.R. by, by William Gaddis. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know when I'm going to read it. I have a hard time getting through all of Proust. I've been, I love um, uh, Carl Ove Knausgaard, the Norwegian writer mm -hmm. now. Sadie Smith was telling me that's Proust for dumb people. And <laughs> I thought that's perfect for me, so I've been, I've been reading that. But Proust for smart people, I, I can only read about two of those. They're long. It's a, it's a lifetime. It's I don't know what to... it is. I don't know what's the matter with me. It's a, but you got through Joyce. Do you, yeah. you got, and, and Finnegan's Wake as well? A lot of Finnegan's Wake. Yeah. A lot you can of just it. dip in at any point. Yeah. It's that big river. Yeah. It's doesn't, not even linear. It's a lot, yeah. Just read whatever you want. It's, um, so... All right, and then, the, and then if, is there an artist in another discipline, music, film, visual arts, that if you could trade places with, you would? They don't have to trade places with you. You I would, become that. I, I would like to be Cole Porter would be the greatest like thing. like to be Cole Porter. Yeah. See? A lot of Cole Porter fans in the See, house yeah. today. Charlie Daniels. Nah. <laughs> not so much Charlie <laughs> Daniels. And then had you not been a writer, back when you read yeah. Portrait of an Artist right. and you were, you know, taken from the priesthood. Right. What would have happened? What would you have been? Um, well, because I decided early, I only had one moment of doubt. And I, um, I, when I was in graduate school in California, I actually had been in India before that, and I was exposed to tuberculosis. So they gave me a test, as they do for everyone, and I came out positive for tuberculosis. And um, I had to go for six months and take these special pills to sort of kill the tuberculosis so it doesn't come back uh, at a different time in my life. So I was seeing a doctor regularly and I was very worried about my writing career at that point. I was out of college, I was you know, in my 20s and I started to realize for the first time what a precarious um, career it is, if you can call it a career, which you can't. Um, and I thought, what am I going to do? I need something to fall back on or something to support myself and I thought, I really like my doctor. Maybe I'll, I'll go to medical school <laughs> because it's interesting. You deal with bodies and people. Chekhov was a doctor. There's all these great, great literary doctors. And so I thought, I'm, gonna, I'm going to become a doctor and go to medical school. And I really was convinced of it. And I went home and I called my mother and I told her, Mom, I'm, I'm going to go to medical school. And she burst out laughing. <laughs> and I thought, that's a very bad sign if your mother laughs, because she's always supported my, my different ambitions. And she knew that I just would be an awful doctor, I would have a bad bedside manner, I would get depressed about the death and dying I was is surrounded she, is by. Is she a doctor? Or no? She, she, she's not a doctor, no, but she just knew that I was not cut My out father, who is a doctor, laughed yeah. at me when I told him the oh, same really? thing. I was in Spain and I had a kind of crisis, same thing. I thought, yeah. this is not going to go well. I was right. 22. And I called my father and said, I think I'm going to go to medical school. You help people. There's so much exactly. information passing across you all the time. And he, he laughed and then he said, no, you're not. Yeah. And as it turns out, it was correct. Yeah. So but there is some kind of, I think writers can, under, can imagine being doctors more than, more than other things. There's a sort of diagnose, diagnostician yeah. right. of people element. And then I guess the last quick question, then we'll go to audience questions. Sure. The short answer is um, uh, the dreaded, what are you working on? Or alternatively, you can say, what are you not working on? Well, I'm working on a book of short stories, so what I, what I read is part of that. And I just have finished um, ad adapting my last novel, The, the Marriage Plot, um, for the screen with, with a director. And um, we've just turned, turned it in, so I don't know. It's very different. I mean, not, it, I, we, might, we might talk about that, but it's, it's really a bad idea to make movies out of novels. I don't know why they do it. Now that I've had to try to stuff the elephant into the suitcase right. of this screenplay form, I see how difficult it is. And um, a friend of mine who's a screenwriter sent me a, a statistic last week. Apparently, uh, of all time, if you count up the, um, the movie proceeds of, all, all of movies forever, 40% of them have come from books. So that's a lot. I mean, books actually do make good movies in some way or successful movies, but I can't believe that's true. I think 90% um, of those are Harry Potter. It might be, yeah. <laughs> and, and, but, they, but it's yeah. true that we were talking right. about it before at dinner, how you 
got lucky with Virgin Suicides and that really it's the short stories that are easier to adapt right. because a director can build it out into a feature. Yeah, I mean, look at Brokeback Mountain. That's, that's right, a, a perfect great, example. A great Whereas example a novel's really deadly. I mean, you, you, even as the author, think of what you have to shed at every turn. Yeah. You have to think of it as a short story and, and jettison most of the novel in order to try to make it a screenplay. Well, it's good that you're the one doing it because you can I'm, euthanize it. It's good that I'm violating myself <laughs> ra rather than someone doing it to me. It's true. It's uh, a fitting epitaph. Mm. So, it's, uh, so now I guess let's go to audience questions sure. and I don't know if I cut you guys short on I time. I feel I've been neglecting this. Yeah, sorry. I this, I you guys came, uh, they've got the animals hanging Now we have a mic there. patrolling like Oprah style. Oh, it's right. It's that guy. So take his microphone so we can all hear your question. Is it uh, apocryphal, or did you, in fact, write lots of middle sex at Tom's in, Pro in uh, Prospect Heights? Oh, um, well, I, I started, it, I didn't write any of it in, at Tom's, <laughs> um, but I did live a, a block away. I think I was writing Virgin Suicides um, when, I, when I lived there, so I, I certainly talked to, um, to Gus, who who used to run it all the time. And he, he loved that I was Greek and he would just like come and squeeze my cheeks every time <laughs> he saw me. Um, and I did do an interview there um, when, when I came back. But mainly I wrote Middlesex in Berlin when I was living in, in Germany. Let's see, you call on. I'll go to the middle right here and then we'll go to that side. Um, you actually read this story in The New Yorker and I just wonder how you feel about the New Yorker's policy of, of giving readers the choice of either reading your short story or hearing you read it. You you did much better with the accent just now tonight. I think. Well, I'm not good on the on the on the. On the oh. I, I think you are excellent. Tonight, oh well, um, that was my first time doing it. Um, well, you know, things keep changing. I'm. I've only been published for about 20 years and it's a completely different business in some ways than it, than it used to be. There are all these other things one is called upon to do. Recording things, um, lots, of, lots of activities around promotion. So you can either resist it completely, um, give into it totally, or kind of be in, in on the fence and say yes to certain things and yes to no. And I try to, I try to take a, a middle course. Um, not that many writers are, are going to really be um, against the New Yorker publishing their short story. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's um, something you're happy to have happen. And, and you would, I don't know, you would be impolite to say, and I won't help you out on your website by, by recording the story in an accent that isn't quite as good as it should be. As it one day will be. <laughs> as it one day will, yes. When Matthew takes over. Uh, down on the very... And uh, yeah, can you tell us what prompted you to move to Berlin? I mean, why Berlin of all the places around the world, and uh, which locations in Berlin do you find most? Why, why did I go to Berlin? Was it yes. the beginning? Yep. What prompted you to what move? Yeah, well, um, this was before Berlin was a, a hip spot. It was 1999, and um, I got a grant. Actually, my, my wife and I um, were getting kicked out of our apartment in Brooklyn <laughs> by a, a mean old landlord <laughs> who didn't want us to have a baby, and we had a baby. And he lived in the building, and he actually could kick us out at will. So we had no place to live. And my wife said, why don't you apply for this grant in Germany? And I did, and I, I didn't think I would get it. I forgot about it, and then I, I got it. So. It came at a time when we were broke and homeless. <laughs> so we went to Berlin, and I didn't really, I wasn't that excited about Berlin. I didn't know much about it. And I found that I, that I, I loved it, and we stayed for five years. We were supposed to be there for only one year. And, and then when we first got there, people were like, why do you want to go to Berlin? And now everyone, you know, oh, I live in Berlin. I, you know, they don't even say I want to go there. They're like, I'm, I'm living there, and I have 18 kids there. Um, but it, it's amazing how it's, how it's changed. There's too many Americans there. I, like, I felt like I was the only American there for a while. It's not true then, but it's definitely not true now. And you got out of Brooklyn on the leading edge, edge, edge of trendiness as, as well. Well, it's interesting. I, you know, I'm from Detroit, right? So you can see how, what happened there. 
<laughs> then, but I moved to Brooklyn, that did well, and I moved to Berlin, that did well, but I'm also Greek, and that's going, you know, so it's, I've got a lot it's of a, different stories. I don't know if I'm good luck or bad luck at this point. Probably a break even. Yeah. So one more, uh, what's our time? We have, we have time, time for, for two, more. two more? Okay, we'll go to the middle, right in front. That's very easy. I would just like to know what was your inspiration for Middlesex, what uh, prompted the, Yeah, what, what the inspiration for Middlesex is a little bit hard for me to explain because it came in different stages over many different years. Uh, and, but when I trace it back, it begins actually also in high school to a Latin class I, I took. We were translating Ovid's Metamorphoses and there's a passage where Zeus and Hera argue about who has a better time in bed, men or women. And I was 16 and people thought Latin was a dull subject, you know, and, and I thought this is pretty good stuff. And um, Zeus says that women have a better time in bed and Hera says men do and they argue about it and finally they say, well let's ask Tiresias, he's been both a man and a woman. So he comes in, Tiresias comes into the poem and he says, if the pleasures of love be as 10, then three times three belong to woman, the rest belongs to man. So you've got nine, I've got one. And I realized there's really not much to hope for in my life. <laughs> but but um, I remembered Ty Tiresias. I mean, here's this incredible character who knows more than the gods themselves. And that's, that's where the idea first came from. Why, you know, since you're, as a novelist, you're trying to go into the heads of, of men and women, why not endow your narrator with this kind of omniscience that, that the normal person doesn't have? That's the first idea. And then year, years later, I read an actual memoir of an uh, intersex person from 19th century France. And um, uh, my curiosity was piqued by this memoir, but the memoir didn't satisfy my, my curiosity. So I thought, I'm going to write the story myself that I, that I wish I was encountering in this book. And that's, that's how it came together. We have time one for more. Those Okay, one two more question. I was okay. going to go back there because somebody she was up, but they there. put their hand down, so I'll go back yeah. to the, that side and let's say the one. Yes, exactly. So, as an immigration lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. No, actually, I'm not Factual even going to problem. address the immigration yeah. fraud at the heart of your story, but I'm also a person of both Texan and German roots, and you address the German roots, but for the Texan part, well, my grandfather had a two-pecker dog, and there was no end of trouble, i got to tell you. <laughs> so what inspired you about the, the Texan character in your story? I don't know. I mean, Jasper Johns said a funny thing about art um, once. I mentioned this in the New Yorker interview, too, but um, he said, do, you know, take an object, do something to it, do something else to it, do something else to it. When the first time I heard that, I thought, what a stupid advice. And I could, <laughs> idiotic advice, but it, it really does speak to the way um, writing fiction and, and, and making art happens. You, you don't have it all in your head at once. You begin with something and you do something to it. So I, I, I just put it into a Texas drawl one day and then later on decided he's not really Texan, he's, he's faking it. And, and that's, how, that's how it happened. You, little by little, you, you make your decisions, you kind of watch what's happening in the story and you let it, you let it direct you to your next idea. I'm not, I'm not one of these writers who says, um, the characters appeared to me and spoke um, the story in some kind of Madame Blavatsky-like way at all. I, th I, think, I think you should be in control of it and yet you have to be aware that you don't know everything at the beginning. You're going to write something and, and other, other ideas are going to occur to you. So it's, a, it's kind of you're imposing your will on it but you're also letting the story um, dictate a certain, a certain amount of the material. And, and when you end up, you're actually very far from where you started and usually in a place that you didn't expect. But I think we'll take just one more question. Okay, so we can go back over to, to that side. Oh, we'll go right here to the middle. That's fine. That's easier. Hi there. Hi. Um, so you spoke a little bit before briefly about how you had that moment where you realized writing might not be a career. And uh, yeah. so I was wondering what made you kind of continue forward with that? And if you have any moments even now where you kind of are writing something, you're like, that's it, I'm yeah. done, I have nothing left, I retire. You weren't, you weren't at my house last night, I was having those <laughs> thoughts. <laughs> About two in the morning, those thoughts. <laughs> Actually, um, Meg Wallitzer, um, the writer and my, and my friend, was telling me that her sh shrink told her and told her that um, at night, when you have those fears and at two in the morning, they absolutely are completely full of crapola. Like, you don't have to listen to those at all. They have no, they seem like the truth. Like, when that happens, you're like, 
I'm shit, you know, I know, I always knew I was, and <laughs> finally I'm really re recognizing it, you know? You feel and you just, all of this stuff, I'm faking it, I'm doing the fraud, this is the truth. Apparently that's completely not true. Your brain is in a different state where it's not really thinking clearly, and this has helped me a lot to, to, to realize this when I wake up in the, in the morning. So I have these thoughts all the time, um, that it's a waste of time. I mean, it's hard to write now. You pick up the, the newspaper and it'll say, our TV serials, the new novel, or, um, <laughs> you know, wh whatever it is. You, you, like, it was bad enough before, and now it seems even worse, and if you let it get to you, it, it, can, it can seem like a, a useless pursuit. So one, one fights against that, one struggles against it, um, both spiritually and emotionally, and of course, fi financially. I just kept going with my writing because I, I couldn't, literally could not do anything else. I, I, had not, I had not trained to do anything. So if it wasn't going to work, um, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. So I was, it was just keep going forward. Excellent. Well, I, I want to thank everybody f for coming and for asking good questions. Not every audience does. And to thank uh, Jeff as well. And Bam and Hellenic Culture and all of you.